Hello, welcome. Thank you all for joining us. A few other folks are popping in, so I'll just give them a second. All right. A few other folks are gonna continue to join, but we're gonna get started promptly at noon. So welcome everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jillian McClare and I'm your director of alumni engagement at Florida Tech here in the Office of Alumni Affairs. And I wanna thank you all for joining us today for this very exciting lunch and learn lecture. I am thrilled to partner with Florida Tech faculty member, Dr. Rob Van Wozik to provide this lecture for you on the current status of coral reefs. Um, I don't know if you guys saw in our last magazine and he probably doesn't want me to mention this, but he was ranked in the top 2% of researchers in the whole entire world for any field. So he's kind of a big deal. So we're very excited to have him today with us. Um, so just a few things to tell you about the format of the event. The lecture will be about 45 minutes with 15 minutes at the end designated for questions and discussion. However, if you think of any burning questions throughout the event, um, that you don't want to forget, feel free to chat, uh, type it, excuse me, in the chat box anytime, and we can circle back and answer them at the end of the event. Lastly, please leave your microphone on mute throughout the duration of the lecture so that we don't get any audio feedback. And real quick to get a better idea of who's joining us today, I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll uh, just to tell us, you know, what class years you were in when you attended Florida Tech, what you got your degree in, et cetera. So if you just take a quick minute to fill that out. Percentage of complete is skyrocketing. You got 60% completed. Let's give it another minute. All right, I'll give you guys 10 more seconds. All right, I'm going to end the polling in three, two, one. Okay. So, we have the most alumni from the mid 1970s to 1980s, 31%. Second highest is from 1996 to 2005. Well, we have a, a good group here from all decades. So that's really exciting to see. What area did you get your degree in? We have the most from science, which doesn't surprise me given the topic of our lecture, 54%, 21% engineering, 17% business, eight aviation. Nobody from Coppola. Uh, where do you currently live? East coast of the US, so a lot from central, few from the west coast, one person from the Caribbean or Central America and two international. If the other folks who live internationally, if you wanna go ahead and type that in the chat box, you can see where you're from, that would be awesome. And have you attended a Lunch and Learn lecture before? 69% said this is my first one. Well, welcome, so happy you guys joined us. Uh, 14 people have been to a couple and one person has been to all of them. So thank you for your support. Okay. So now to introduce our esteemed faculty member, Dr. Rob Van Wozik is a professor of ocean engineering and marine sciences here at Florida Tech, of course, as well as the director of the Institute of Global Ecology at Florida Tech. He has studied coral reefs in the Pacific, Indian and Atlantic Oceans since 1982 and has written more than 180 scholarly research articles on coral reefs. He was the environmental editor for the International Journal of Coral Reefs from 2006 to 2013. His research interests are mainly focused on the ecology of reef building corals, including the effects of land use change and global climate change. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Van Wozik. Right, thank you. So it's, it's wonderful to be here. I, I just had a quick look at all the faces and, and it's it's great. Sometimes I have trouble getting all the students in my class to show me their faces, but this is great. And I noticed there's some 
uh, former students, uh, not just from my lab, but from different classes. So this is wonderful. So so thanks for attending. I'm going to talk about um, th this title was given to me, but I want to talk about this title then: the current status of coral reefs uh, around the world. So so let me first of all talk about reefs in general and and maybe some of the major concepts that we have to really understand before we start thinking about the, the status of reefs. And you know, coral reefs are, are fairly unique systems. You can, you can see them from, from space. You can actually see the Great Barrier Reef from the moon. So these are some of the only real systems, biological systems that we can see from space. But what they are, uh, they're in the, the sort of the interface between the, the ocean and, and the atmosphere and the land. So, so these are these coral reefs that can be influenced by the land and, and the ocean, but also what's going on in the atmosphere. So coral reefs are, are structured or, or built, if you like, by, by living organisms. And, and most of the, the reef is, is built by these corals. These are the, the corals here. And when you think about a, a coral, what is a coral? Well, it's sort of like an upside down jellyfish that can get calcium uh, and carbon from the water column and, and build this, this skeleton around itself. And those can form geological structures. So this is the sort of the, the process that you can, you can get uh, calcium ions and carbonate ions to form calcium carbonate. So that's the, the big geological structure that we call a, a, a coral reef or a skeleton. And these reefs can be incredibly diverse. We've got, we've got hundreds of different corals out there in the world, and they can be incredibly beautiful to look at. The, the, the color, the vivid colors are, are, are tremendous. So, so when we think about where these reefs are, they're distributed primarily around the tropics and the subtropics. Um, and, and this is sort of a, a high diverse area through there. But we only see coral reefs where the where the, the temperatures are above 18 degrees Celsius. So we're, we're not seeing real reef growth um, anywhere below those temperatures. So that, that comes back uh, later on when we start talking about climate change and expansion, potential expansion of reefs. So so one of the dilemmas that um, that Charles Darwin had when he was studying reefs way back in the in the 1800s is how do we get these incredible structures with, with all this life and in these crystal clear waters where the nutrients are, are really low in, in concentration so that was one of his dilemmas when he wrote wrote his book in 1842 he, he mentioned this but he didn't have a solution to it he actually called them um, coral insects which is sort of sort of cute they're not really insects but you know, we, we've got to we've got to forgive him because he had the incredible intellect with with everything else. But he he came up with the idea that these these coral reef atolls uh, are generated by uh, reef organisms. He, he he got that, but also that they started off growing around these these islands, and those islands would subside if you get a, a plate moving across the ocean. Sometimes those those plates would subside and the island would go with it. But the reef, because it's a living entity, can keep up with that relative drop in, in sea level. So you can get these, these incredible atolls sitting out there in the middle of, of nowhere. But then, you know, we, we look at these places and we, we see this crystal clear water and all this life. And you think, where is, where's all the, the, the nutrients coming from? And, and so we have to look into the superstructure of these corals and these polyps. So the coral itself is an animal, but inside the animal itself, uh, a whole lot of uh, plants. Well, they're, they're actually dinoflagellates, but let's call them plants for now. And this, these are unicellular, one, one cell plants, and there's millions of them. And these plants can photosynthesize, use the sun's energy. And, and, and get nutrients from from that from that energy from the sun, and and translocate that energy to the animal, and the animal, like any animal, will excrete um, products, and those excretion products can be used by the algae, 
so so this is beautiful symbiosis that started roughly about 245 million years ago and and so they the, the corals can live off small amounts of nutrients and it and it's sustainable because it gets recycled in that system so here's a, a sort of a schematic of the photosynthetic uh, dinoflagellates we call them symbionts there's lots of other names we can call them but let's call them symbionts for now and they go through this photosynthesis and, and give nutrients to the to the corals so darwin's dilemma is solved by um, thinking about these systems these low nutrient systems uh, but this recycling and this symbiosis um, allows us to solve that dilemma so recycling system over a couple of hundred million years of success is, is very sustainable and, and, I, and I guess we can learn from that a, a lot as, as human beings and we, we start recycling and reprocessing things that we generate would probably be better off. But some of the issues we have out there um, is, is very disturbing and it's I'm not going to try and um, tell you all of the disturbances because there's a lot of weight on my shoulders trying to trying to deal with that um, but one of the biggest disturbances we have out there now is that the water temperatures of the oceans are increasing and it doesn't matter which ocean you look at um, they're all increasing and they're at slightly different rates but it's it's a global phenomenon and and the reason for this increase is has been known for a long time and this is um, for years um, this is a, a photograph of, or a, ske a sketch of Fourier, but he actually wrote many papers and a, and a book about that the earth can act as a greenhouse. When you have CO2 increasing into that atmosphere, it heats up and that sunlight radiation from the sun, gets trapped in the earth and that's a, that greenhouse effect can really exacerbate and increase the temperatures of the atmosphere. But that temperature of the atmosphere, when it increases, it increases the ocean temperatures as well. So we've known about this for hundreds of years, and, and now we're starting to get these, these reports coming through every five, six or so years uh, from different agencies that get together and, and put this report together. This is the, called the IPCC report, Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, and it's, it's basically saying the same thing, yes the climate is changing and the ocean temperatures are increasing. And that's primarily because the central reason is we're, in, we're increasing greenhouse gases and burning of fossil fuels into our atmosphere and it's changing the temperature of the planet. Now the rate of change of that temperature is, is about 100 times faster than anything we've seen in the past few hundred uh, millennia. So that rate of change is, is super fast and some organisms are having trouble adjusting. So some of the repercussions of that is that the air temperature rises, the ocean temperature rises, and the pH of the oceans is decreasing, and there's melting of sea caps. So we've got the ice caps on the on the Antarctic and in Greenland, and this is increasing the sea level. So even from yesterday, and our NASA governmental website, the Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is about 415 parts per million. So you can keep a track on that, um, and you can see uh, you can see that in, in Celsius as, as as well the rate of increase. But also the the sort of the the ice and, and what's happening with that ice those ice sheets. So that temperature is having an effect on on coral reefs and having a tremendous effect, and it's. It's, it's really changed uh, the way I, I start looking at coral reefs over the last 20 years or so. Before that, we weren't as concerned about temperature. But I wanted to add a couple of things here that will allow us to learn how to move forward and to think about conservation into the future. So this is a, a normal coral here, and this is a, a bleached coral. And when we add stress to that normal coral, and it could be high temperature or high light, or we could add um, fresh water or pathogens, that coral will go through a shock and, and it loses a lot of its symbionts. 
And, and when it loses those symbionts, we call that a bleaching because it, because it looks white. But many of these corals, as I pointed out before, need those symbionts to survive because that's its food source. So if this particular coral loses its, its symbionts after 10 days, it would be dead. But I wanted to also add a lot of people think of, of coral bleaching as, as an effect of this temperature. And it's really not. So this graph is a paper we published years ago. And, and what it does is what we, we put some black tape over some of this, this particular coral here and subjected it to these different temperatures. And what we found is that even under high temperature, the coral didn't bleach where there was no light coming through. So that's a that was a really important experiment. And we realized that light and temperature together caused the bleaching, not just temperature. And, and here's a graph. I took a photo in the field years ago, and it's, it's I, I like this this uh, photo a lot. And the reason is that it shows the effect of temperature and light. And let's look at this. This is a, a photo from the Philippines and this coral on the top here is bleached. And so is this coral on the side. But this coral underneath this coral, again, this coral is underneath this coral, so it's getting shaded, is the same species as this and it's not bleached as much. So these two corals are experiencing the same temperatures. It's warm, so it's 31, 32 degrees, 33 at times, but this one is not bleaching. So this becomes important when I start talking about where things are going to survive in the future. This is in full sunlight and it's bleaching. This one's in shade and it's not bleaching. That's a key point. So a couple of my schematics here. Um, showing that light and temperature together will cause that, that stress. Um, if I increase the light and keep the temperature the same, the coral is going to feel, if you like, a stress and it's, and it's also going to bleach. But if I reduce the light, and even though I've got high temperature, the coral may be okay. So that's those, that photograph that I took in the Philippines describes those three cartoonish graphs, if you like. So what we, what we usually get, if we think about photosynthesis, and I'm not gonna talk about this too much, but I do wanna point out one thing, that what happens when we, we get a lot of stress is that photosynthesis can't go through that light dark reaction and generate um, carbohydrates, and we get a buildup of oxygen radicals, and those oxygen radicals cause a lot of damage, and that's why the coral bleaches. So this is what we get. We get this type of effect and it looks, looks fairly you know, colorful enough, but a lot of these corals will be dead after about 10 days. So these, there's a lot of different species out there. Like again, 14 days at the most, these corals will die after bleaching, but this one doesn't die. This species here bleaches and it bleaches and it comes back after about two months, so it regains its symbiont. So this thing can keep on feeding uh, from the water column, but the other ones cannot. Here, this one is a really tolerant coral, so it bleaches and it regains its symbionts after about seven months, it's back to what it was. So bleaching doesn't mean death for all corals. So we've got these, what we call winners and losers out there, and these corals here, the branching, fast growing are the, are the winners, are the losers, sorry. And these massive corals are more the, the winners. And here, this one here is like a cockroach. It's going to survive. You can throw a nuclear bomb at this thing and it's gonna, it's gonna live on. So we've got these, these winners and losers. And, and so we're, we're, we're looking at why some of these corals are, are, are losers and why these some corals are winners looking at their differential tolerance. So this is not something from the past. This is something that, that's happening um, just very recently, 2014, 2017 El Nino bleaching event. Um, this is an area I do a lot of work in, in, in Micronesia. Just over in October last year, just a few months ago, there was a major bleaching event. We had a um, a team, I didn't go because for obvious reasons, we can't travel. 
but I still had a lot of contacts and teams over in these islands, and it was an, we did an extensive uh, field study to to learn from this. As we speak, this is from yesterday, uh, two days ago, Great Barrier Reef area, Papua New Guinea. The water temperatures are very high and unusually high, so this is something that's ongoing. So we're interested in the sort of the big picture in, in my lab, which, which locations bleach more than others. So what we've done very recently is, is got a whole lot of data from over 10,000 surveys. And those data sets uh, give us information at a site level, whether there's severe bleaching or moderate or mild or no bleaching. And we can piece together uh, a puzzle to see over the last 20 years what's happened. Um, and it's, you know, we use, we use models and, and, and statistics and, and, and big computers and we, we sort of get some insight into the world. And, and what we found is that the temperature, as the thermal temperature increases, we get more bleaching. And the rate of change, some places have very fast rates of change of, of, of temperature, sorry, SST is the sea surface temperature, and we get an increase in bleaching. But what we also found is that we get less bleaching whether the, where there's been long-term um, sea temperature variability. So places where they have high, low variability doesn't bleach as much. And then we can put probabilities on a map and say where those places are. And, and one, of the, one of the major findings we found in this, in this recent study um, was that coral reefs around the tropics are doing much better than other locations, especially at the latitudes uh, sort of 15 to, to 20 in the northern hemisphere. Those places are not doing as well, but the tropics, isn't that interesting? So that's where all the heart of the diversity is. They seem to be doing quite well. We think it's to do because they're so um, adjusted or adapted, if you like, to those warmer temperatures. What we also found is that bleaching is occurring at a higher temperature in the last 10 years than it was 10 years before. So there's some sort of adjustment going on, whether it's an adaptation, we're not quite sure, or whether it's some, some corals have died off and the ones that are left are more tolerant, probably a bit of both. And so we're, we're seeing that adjustment happening. What we're also doing is finding locations that we call what we call bright spots. And so we're getting places on the, on, the, on the globe where we see that there's less bleaching than other locations. And, and so those bright spots are important for us to consider for potential global sanctuaries. So that's one thing, but there's another thing going on and that's the sea level rise that we have to consider. And, and some of the places that we do research the sea level and anybody you talk to, if, if they're somebody in elementary school or somebody that's um, 90 years old, they know that the sea level is coming up because they live in that environment all the time and they can see their, their docks and jetties getting covered and more frequently covered by, by the oceans. So these are projections of sea level rise, depending on how much carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere and, and hopefully we'll stay on this path but sometimes on some mornings i get up and i think we're on this other path here which is i'm not going to go into the details of that but what these these different projections are is how much energy from the sun is going to be absorbed by the planet and therefore how fast we're going to warm so this is particularly concerning the sea level rise, especially places like here, you look at the Marshall Islands. And this is uh, somewhere we went to, it's actually, it's in my, it's my background here. This is a, a photograph from the Marshall Islands. Um, so this is the Marshall Islands and you'll notice something, it's okay, it's an atoll in the middle of the ocean, but it's no more than about a meter above sea level. And, and so when you have a sea level rise and you're living on a, on an island that's this high above sea level, there's a the call for concern. And, and very frequently now, storms will come through and wash over 
some of these atolls, whereas in the past they didn't wash over as frequently. And this is a famous photo. This is the, um, the Parliament of the, the Maldives signing a, a declaration of urgency. Uh, the whole Parliament, uh, this, this Senate is on scuba, and um, you know, this is obviously taken for you know, get some press coverage. But they want they want people to realise that the Marshall Islands and uh, and the Maldives and places like this are little atolls, and they're, they're being inundated very quickly. So some of the, the research we looked at is what's the relationship between the temperature and reef growth. And in other words, where will coral reefs keep up with sea level rise? So I'm, I'm not gonna talk about this graph too much, but we can calculate how well a reef can grow and keep up with sea level rise, depending on how, what, what's growing there. Um, what sort of biological community is there and how many sediments are coming in. And, and what we do is, is calculate that and we can put this on a map. And we went across all of these islands and did some calculations. So this is the Pacific here, right in the middle of the Pacific, for the Western Pacific and Palau all the way to um, to uh, Christmas Island over here in the, in the Republic of, of, of Kiribati. So what we did is did some transects, a lot of studies, and what we found is that some islands, the reefs have a high capacity to keep up the sea level rise. There's a, in Palau and Yap, these have a very strong capacity to keep up the sea level rise. But then once we go over to Christmas, those places are getting hit by El Nino and, and temperature shocks all the time. And they have a very low capacity to keep up with sea level rise. So when you get a, a, a reef that's thriving and flourishing in other words it, it should be able to keep up with sea level rise but when you get a degraded reef it, there's going to be all sorts of problems and if you're on especially on an island it's not going to the reef is not going to keep up and the reef and the island will get inundated so this is a healthy looking system here not many species but you can see the the, the cutoff here is, is is because of low water spring tides so that reef is keeping up with that low water spring tide and it's that's rising now at about two to three millimeters per year and this is a place that will not be able to keep up with sea level rise it's just not enough corals and doesn't really have that capacity so you know thinking back in in, in darwin's work some of these atolls may end up uh, drowning and others may keep up with sea level rise. And I know uh, the, the Department uh, of Defense is really interested in that, especially some of the US uh, naval bases. So we're interested in, in my lab, where are the climate change uh, refuges? So thinking about these sea level anomalies and these temperatures, we have to really try and predict what places and where those locations will be able to um, tolerate some of these temperature rises. So, so one of the places that we have uh, worked in a lot, and we, we think it's uh, a potential climate change refuge, well, at least some of the places are. And let me sort of talk you through this one. So this is the, the satellite image of, of Palau. And in 2010, there was a very strong um, temperature stress on those reefs and you can see the temperatures here are, are, are super high especially around these islands here. but then when we did an extensive survey this is the results of the survey we found that the red area is high damage but the blue area is no damage so when you compare that temperature and the lack of damage there's a there's a disconnect here you would expect the high temperatures would cause high damage. So when you look at that more uh, closely, these islands through here, and this is probably just another way of saying that high temperatures in the bays, but there was less bleaching. When we look in the bays, we find that the water is a lot more turbid and that turbidity is reducing light. And now remember when we first started talking, temperature, and light together, you, you get that stress. So if you have a naturally turbid environment, 
it, it, you can't be too turbid because then you won't have any any photosynthesis at a capacity at all. But reducing the light slightly will actually uh, moderate those thermal stress events. So it turns out that these bays, these inner reefs, are really important because they seem to be surviving through um, these climate change shocks. So natural turbidity is something that we're really looking at. And so from that study, what we did is, is looked at uh, natural turbidity um, across the planet. And I'm not talking about here, oh, dredgings uh, projects or anything like that. And I'm just talking about natural near shore turbidity to see if that, if we can find places that will um, survive through potentially some of these, these temperature shocks. And, and it turns out we find places that uh, are natural refuges. There's an example, we've got this now for sort of the whole world and some places like in uh, Indonesia and Kalimantan and some of these other places, Sulawesi, they have high natural turbidity and these places also don't get as much uh, coral bleaching. So the clear waters and, and temperature shock ends up when you get, you get bleaching, but when you get slightly turbid waters and temperature shocks, you get low bleaching. So this is, um, is, is interesting because it allows us to hopefully think about where we should be protecting our reefs in a different way. We always thought that the clear water reefs are the beautiful ones, we've got to protect all of them. But maybe these near shore reefs, and I'll talk about Florida in a second, some of these near shore reefs are um, very valuable and we should be looking after them a, a lot more. And obviously when the system becomes too turbid, we can't get photosynthesis and we can't get reefs. Okay, so we're starting to, to think about the, these sort of global locations where we may have uh, what I'm going to call global sanctuaries potentially. There's not that many of them, but there are certainly some that we're starting to identify as, as potential places that look like they can survive through. And so we're trying to write in the literature, let's look after these because they may be the refuges. We get through this climate scenario and we can look after them. And they may be the seed for other reefs to come back. So that's the idea. What about Florida you're saying? Um, well, we, we, there's a lot of work going on in Florida. Um, there's been a lot of studies in Florida. There's been moderate bleaching for all of these years. So they've been hammered by bleaching and, and, and recently by some diseases. Um, and we're noticing that the reefs, uh, the coral cover on the reefs in shallow and in deep have declined tremendously. So there's a lot of restoration work going on in Florida, um, involved in some of that, helping the agencies to determine where to outplant. So these are this is an endangered species of coral. This is called a cropper cervicornis or staghorn coral. And this is on a nursery. This is a PVC pipe and some nylon, and they grow there, and they grow quite well. Uh, there's lots of current through here. And these nurseries, then people go out uh, and, and plant these these nursery uh, bread corals onto a reef and put some cement on and hopefully they'll grow and produce reproduce and then bring back some of those populations so there's lots of work going on with that right now um, what's important is to know where to outplant them and not put them in necessarily the wrong place otherwise it's just wasting everybody's time so these are all the locations that the outplanting is going on right now. These are all the different uh, programs. There's uh, six major programs, uh, Nature Conservancy, uh, Moat Marine Lab, Florida Fish and Wildlife, uh, Cori Foundation, University of Miami, and uh, Nova Southeastern University up, up here. So there's lots of activity. We're, we're, we're trying to make this happen. Uh, lots of outplants already. Um, thousands, tens of thousands of outplants, especially in the lower keys. This is ongoing. Um, they're aiming for a million over the next few years. So 
just a couple of quick graphs to point out that it depends on the size of the art plants. So this is a survival and this is time. The small our plants that they take from the nurseries, they're not doing so well. So we have to get to a larger size and then our plant them and they do a lot better. Um, that seems fairly obvious, which is, which is good. It's good when science is obvious. And it depends on where we are plant them. So the Biscayne region, again, this is survival up here. This is good. Down here, it's not doing so well. The outplants in the Biscayne Bay region is, is more successful, it seems, than they are in um, the Middle Keys and in the Marquesas. So there's lots of reasons we're trying to work that out, uh, but we're starting to get a, a, a vision on where outplanting is being more, more successful than in other places. We're also coming up, I think this is one of my last slides. So we're also coming up with the probability maps of where outplanting should occur so this is a what i'll call a calling it a niche space so probably the red is the the, the best places um sorry if you're colorblind I, I should have considered that um the, this is the best places to outplant these these corals and and the, down here the green is probably the not, not the best place because it looks like they're not going to survive dry tortugas looks like a great place so these are the type of maps we're coming up with to allow um, the people involved in the nurseries and the restoration to, to plant them in a reasonable place. Okay, so, so there's, there's that engineering um, restoration aspect to it, but it, you know, a lot of this depends on our decisions on, on where the, the planet's going to go and how warm it's going to get. Um, the warmer it's going to get, the more we're going to have to try and restore, uh, but that's, that's basically our decision. So last slide, I'm going to conclude the, and hopefully we'll have some, some questions, but the projected changes in climate and seem to be driving these temperatures outside the, the modern experience. There's some winners and losers out there and, and we're trying to understand the biology of the, the winners and the losers. Um, we're also finding that some places are acting as, as climate change refuges, which is exciting. Um, and the initial locations, as I said, are, are becoming really important refuges. And I've dug back into sort of the, the geological literature and it turns Well, can you hear me now? Something happened to my microphone. Um, I'm not sure where that cut out. So I'm, I was just saying that initial refuges uh, we're also geological refuges in the past, so we've got to try and take care of them. Um, it's not just the clear water systems that have always been the iconic coral reef systems. We need to think about these, these near shore refuges. And obviously, when you get closer and closer to shore, there's, there's, there's other sources of, of problem, for example, rivers and local pollutant sources. Um, we still need to think about doing local um, enforcement in terms of marine protected areas you know but one of the big ones is the regional and global action and climate change and that'll that'll allow the reefs to, to come back and bounce back and and, and look after um, and act as you know, resources um, and provide goods and services for people into into the future so so thanks for listening and um, I'm going to open it up for questions. If you guys have questions, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask in person. If not, you're free to type it in the chat and we can read it from there. Larry Pollack asks, turbidity to mean means total suspended solids, which may equate to silting, which may perhaps also be bad for corals. In Palau, as an example, isn't the water tinted by organic acids leading to a, a natural sunblock reducing UV radiation? Yep, good question. Um, when when you when I talk about turbidity in general, I'm talking about uh, suspended solids, anything that's suspended in the water column. But turbidity doesn't always equate with a sedimentation. So we we think of silt in the water column, but that doesn't always fall out of suspension.
you need to have um, a low energy environment. So in Palau, for example, there's some really big tides. So there's three meter tides in six hours. So that water stays in suspension and it doesn't really have a capacity to fall out of suspension. So we can't necessarily think that turbidity and, and sedimentation is how much sediment falls on the substrate are necessarily the same thing. But there's some, there's some good points there about you know, what's in the water column. Um, it, it, you know, these are some blocking. We don't want to reduce the, the, um, the photosynthetic active radiation too much because otherwise there won't be photosynthesis. So there's a, there's a sort of a happy medium we're trying to understand where that is. And I'm certainly not advocating for, you know, let's go and dredge and generate sediments everywhere because that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Please. So Michael McDavid asked, maybe it was implied, but what about the role of acidification? Yeah, I didn't talk about acidification too much. Um, I mean, it, it's it's important. There's only so much you can do in 45 minutes. And, um, you know, I've had uh, students in my lab work on ocean acidification. I, I think it's 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 a silent creeper that's, that's happening. It seems to be more um, important, not important, but a more uh, dramatic of an effect at the higher latitudes. And the coral reefs are not suffering as much because they're fairly super saturated. Um, it's still there, but I think that the overwhelming effect is temperature, and that that umbrella effect of temperature is something I really have, have focused on over the last 20 years. So Kevin sent me um, a question uh, directly. He said, uh, with the light blocking ability of seawater, does that tend to preserve corals at slightly greater depths, say below 25 feet? Uh, so, so, can you say that again? Sorry, I missed that. That's okay. Uh, Kevin asked, with the light blocking ability of seawater, does that yeah. tend to preserve corals at slightly greater depths, say below 25 feet? Right. I, I see. What, yes, I see what you're saying. Yes. And, and so the, the, the corals that are deeper don't get as much sunlight, um, but then they don't get that, that high intensity of, of thermal shock as well. So that's right, Kevin, that's exactly what, what does happen. Um, so some of these deeper corals are, are, are doing much better. They don't reproduce as much, but that's exactly it. Um, somebody here in the chat says, I think it's Peter McCarthy says, are more nutrients in turbid waters? Generally, yes, there are more nutrients and, and nutrients can be uh, uh, a problem, especially when we get phosphates and nitrate levels that are too high. Because when you think about the, um, the effects of, of nutrients, that will increase the symbiont density. And it's a bit like um, getting your, your grandmother's uh, favorite plant and putting it outside in the sun, um, you're going to get in a lot of trouble because what's going to happen is going to burn, right? So what will happen when you get lots of nutrients, the, the pigments in the symbionts and the number of symbionts themselves increase. So as soon as there's a thermal stress with, with light, you're going to get this burning effect. So again, we're trying to find this happy medium between turbidity and, and, and nutrients and where places will, will do well, but certainly high nutrient levels near river mouths, um, that can be very problematic. Why is DOD interested in coral reef studies? They're interested because we've got a lot of military stations on coral reefs in the Pacific. And if they're gonna drown, that's a lot of equipment. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think it's as simple as that. Um, cultural impacts, central Philippines, for example. Yeah, there's lots of the cyanide fishing and dynamite fishing. Certainly, um, it's, it's, it's very scary. I mean, I've been in the Philippines many times, <laughs> been underwater, heard and seen dynamite fishing. It, it's certainly, um, it's, it's not a pleasant experience. Certainly not good for the corals. They have a lot of issues with regulation, 
some of the most um, successful regulation policies have been implemented at the very local level, at the community level. And, and so there's a real rise in those type of uh, studies and, and work, trying to not to regulate from the top down, from the government level, but trying to say, this is our reef, we're a community, we're going to look after our own system. And it seems to be the most effective way to do this. So I think a little bit of both is, is probably the, the optimal there. Um, I think I missed one. About winners and losers. Uh, well, the same plastic corals are much more likely to keep up sea level. So there's a question here about winners and losers. And the ones are the faster growing corals more likely to keep up with sea level rise? Yes, to, to some degree. Um, but they're also more porous. So they don't form as a uh, harder substrate. So some of the best reef builders are the big massive what we call parietes, and they're, they're a real winner. So I think in the future, even though they don't grow as fast, um, they seem to be the ones that we really have to look after. Uh, what am I missing here? Fundamental books you would recommend. Uh, I, could, I could send Gillian a, a, a book. I've also sent uh, Gillian all the slides that will be available for everybody so they can look at some of those references. Thank you for the talk. Um, there was a thriving reef found in the Amazon River, in the river mouth. I'm not an expert, but this looks like it's in, in turbid water. Yes, yeah, so they found um, just underneath the Amazon River, they found a, an extensive coral reef. Um, the Amazon River is obviously fresh water and fresh water flows over the top of the salt water. So that salt water um, system is still being preserved. Um, there's, there's not as much light down there, but the, there's still a, a reef system that's been thriving there for uh, thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. So it, it makes sense that these systems can still survive. Um, possible impact of plastics and microplastics. Oh, wow, um, that, that's a huge issue. It's, it's something that's incredibly disturbing and uh, especially, um, well, it's everywhere. It's even in our Indian River Lagoon. It's, it's throughout the whole Pacific. The microplastics are, are a real concern for seabirds and, and um, all, all sorts of animals. It's something we've really got to get a handle on. And um, I, I just don't think it's going to get much better or it gets worse. I don't have a solution for it, except for use for plastics that degrade very quickly that's, instead of sitting around for thousands of years. <clears throat> it says, um, are you familiar with uh, soft coral reefs of Georgia? I am not. Um, I'd like to go up there one day and have a look at them myself. <laughs> I'm, I deal more with the, the reefs off Florida and, um, whatever else, but I haven't, haven't dived off the reefs of Georgia. <clears throat> and yes, I said I'd share the presentation with everybody. That's another question. It's hard to keep up with the chat. Sorry, I'm missing a few there. <laughs> okay, yeah, there's a few statements here that I'm not sure if there's a, there's a question. Oh, there's a question at the end. Um, Dove off Grand came in December. Some of the reef didn't look too good. Fish populations were noticeably reduced. I mean, this this is the the you know, wherever we go, this is the case. And uh, there's been some places uh, incredibly well regulated, and the reefs seem to be thriving uh, at a local level, but not but not at the uh, not at the sort of the regional level. Uh, so Lauren wrote a question about crop reserve cornices rest restoring. What about all these other corals? Um, good question. There's a lot of work being done on these other corals, especially the massive corals, because when you saw my map, it showed that some places in Florida are good for the, the staghorn coral. But 
we're trying to produce maps now for the other corals and that publication actually has maps that show that. Okay, I, I, can you see a question I may have missed, Jillian? Um, there are a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to keep up with it as it came along. <laughs> There's a question, are we to see reef formation higher and lower latitudes as, well, as temperatures decrease? Do we see this now? So the question is, whether there's a difference in higher and lower latitudes. What we do see at the moment, if, if you fly across um, Hawaii and you end up sort of fly over to Japan, you'll notice that at 29 degrees, you will not see any more reefs. And you think, well, that's maybe because the subsistence of, uh, of the Hawaiian Islands. Well, you, you keep flying over to Japan and you fly up those UQ Island chain up to the main island, and again at 29 degrees, you won't see any reefs. So reefs below that, but not above that. So let me see if I can get an answer from some of you on what do you think is causing that demarcation directly at 29 degrees? Would it be temperature, would it be light, or would it be both? It'll be both, right? It'd have to be both. So, so we need that. We need both of them that are optimal. And if, if we, if we think about reefs moving potentially moving up up north uh, in the northern hemisphere and south in the southern hemisphere, there's a limit that they can move because the light will not be sufficient because that light will will ex extinguish very quickly in the first couple of meters of water. So we can think, yes, okay, there's going to be some movements into the northern. Uh, latitudes, but it's limited by how much light is available. And we're not going to change the, the angles between the Earth and the Sun in a hurry, unless we do something really dramatic. <laughs> so I have a question. Um, Dr. Van Wozik yeah. and I were chatting before uh, the event, and um, I kind of asked about like how resilient, um, you know, the Earth is and how oftentimes if we just let it be, it'll regenerate. Um, I was wondering if you would tell everyone about the, the occasion with the, the volcano. Yeah, yeah, thanks for reminding me about that. So in, in Indonesia, we had the opportunity to go to uh, a vo volcanic eruption off the Bandar Islands. It was uh, back in 1989, it erupted and formed all this lava spewed out over the top of this reef and buried everything. So we went there four years later, four and a half years later, and hundreds of species had come back and the reef was covered by 65% coral cover within four and a half years. And, and so to me, that's always a reminder of the, the striking ability of nature to bounce back. Don't forget around those Bandar Islands, the reefs hadn't all been damaged. So there was larvae coming in, uh, coral planula, and new, new recruits coming in all the time. So it just, just reminds me of the, of, the, of the strength of the resilience of, of a natural system if we, if we just leave it alone. And that was the fastest recovery that's ever been recorded on the planet. So it, it just gives us hope if we can just take that pressure off somewhat, um, the system will take care of itself. And when you think about that, you know, an entire reef growing and keeping up with sea level rise, Think about how much concrete that would be to try and do that in, in the human uh, man-made sense. That's, that's an, they can grow um, about 20 uh, kilograms of calcium carbonate per square meter per year. That's a lot of calcium carbonate for an entire reef system. So these reefs are a, a natural um, forming uh, barriers, if you like, and, and and we can't even think about uh, you know doing it that on a similar scale in terms of you know, developing concrete walls. I mean, the Dutch have been pretty good at building dikes, but they've only got a little block of land, and um, you know I, I can't imagine trying to do that in the Pacific Islands. They want they need a natural reef to do that for them. That's that's my point. So another follow up question. Um, 
with all the, the different research that you've done and, and you're seeing, you know, different ways that coral reef can be restore, restored or, you know, picking out refuges, like what, what are you most hopeful about in terms of seeing the continuation of coral reef population in the world? <laughs> Did I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it depends. But sometimes I'm most hopeful when I when I start seeing um, countries really putting in a lot of effort to to look after their reefs. Uh, you know, having having seen the Philippines and, and places in Indonesia really go backwards, uh, but then I then I see how some places can get together, and I, and I see all the effort going in in Florida. And people really want this to happen and succeed. They want their, their reefs and the, the, the fishes and it, you know the resources there and for the future and for the for the children and grandchildren. So I think I think we're you know some people living in Nebraska may not care as much, but but certainly the people that are close to to nature realize that these are uh, incredible systems and 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 you know, talking to islanders and uh, the people that are close to these systems I, that gives me a lot of hope. Because they they know how, how how wonderful these these systems these you know, living and growing ecosystems really are. But other days, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to talk about politics. But but it, it takes a lot of willpower for people to get together and, and, and succeed with this. And I think I think there's there's a possibility that we can bring these systems back. Well. What you've gone over today certainly brings me hope because you know I was telling you before I watch all these documentaries about how just all the corals are dying, but it's very, very reassuring to see that they can regenerate, that there are many different things that we can kind of tweak and work on to kind of support them and in the ways that we are able to. Right. And 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 I think documentaries can be wonderful to, to look at, but they are very specific about a certain location. And what we're trying to do is give you a map of the world and say, this is what's going on. And some of the, the, the greatest hope, I suppose, is when some of those graphs came out from our recent paper that showed the tropics surviving through and not bleaching as much as other locations. And then thinking back through extinction events in the past, through you know the Triassic extinction event and, and, and others, where in the tropics, things did do very well. Uh, more so than in other locations. So there's a sort of an inbuilt resilience in, in, the, in the planet. And we have to look at how that system responded in the past to how it's responding now. So I like those maps um, because, you know, I, I, I love Dave, David Attenborough, but some of, the, some of the documentaries are very specific. Yes, this is dying here, but if you go over here, it's still doing okay. So we need to sort of see the balance uh, between what what's going on and you know which places are dying and which ones aren't. All right. Well, I think we're just about out of time. And um, if we you know didn't get to your question, I, I apologize. There were so many fast and furious. Um, but once again, uh, Dr. Van Wozik, I just want to sincerely thank you for for taking your time um, to give this lecture for our alumni. Uh, I know they appreciate it as well. So. Sure, sure, Jillian. And, and if the questions, if I miss the questions, they can always send you an email and you can compile the questions and I can I can write up some answers, Jillian. I don't Absolutely. mind doing that. I'm happy to do yeah. that. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and thank you for the intelligent questions and thanks for showing your faces. I really appreciate that a lot. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming, and I look forward to seeing you all at a, another Lunch and Learn lecture sometime in the future. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.